That's true. Naked Palpatine. Um. <laughs> oh, oh, you think that one? Fresh out of the clone tank, nude Palpatine is my That's well, the first thing I think of when you say Dark Empire Palpatine. Make sure to walk with rhythm and welcome back to the Dune universe. This time we have Children of Dune, written by Frank Herbert. What can I say that hasn't already been said? I'm not doing a podcast. Um, I'm not doing walking with rhythm like Jeremy from Stupid Chainsaw Productions, where he's, you know, talked to somebody else on this, like, you know, like everybody's kind of talked about it. But the movie has come out recently of Dune. I feel like a lot of people are coming into the Dune franchise not knowing too much. So, let me tell you a little bit about it. Um, this takes place, what is it, eight years, seven years after the events of Dune Messiah. We follow, a, um, we follow the children of Paul Atreides, which is Ganema, I'm probably butchering the name, and Leto the second, um, as they deal with a bunch of political machinations going on, um, as they go and try to figure things out for this golden path. We also have more going on with Alaya uh, Atreides, the sister to Paul. We have uh, a lot of world building here for what the world is like now after Doom Messiah. Um, there's no new characters, but it is interesting to see where all the old... Well, there's a new... There's a grandson of um, Shaddam, and he's actually a pretty decent dude. Uh, he's all right. And so that's that's a new addition. Uh, and, of course, the, the kids. But by and by, it's it's mostly characters we've already known. It's the last time we're really going to see people that we, we, we know outside of Leto. And so it's, it's cool to see kind of the conclusion to everything here. And... Um, yeah, I mean, it is, it's basically the story. I mean, Dune and Dune Messiah was about a man trying to control destiny, trying to control the future, and having to walk away because it, it gets out of control beyond anything he, he thought he could handle. Though he did see things that Leto has revelations about in this book, but he simply was too human and refused to give that up. Difference being Leto the second was born Fremen, was never known anything but that life. And he, unlike his father, is able to make decisions that his father wouldn't. And he's going to set humanity on this golden path. And we'll see more about that as we get to the next book, God Emperor of Doom, which is my friend Revanchist's favorite novel in the Dune universe, so we'll see how I feel when I get there. But I, I don't really want to talk about spoilers here, but I can say if you watched the movie, and then you read the book, and you read Doom Messiah, and you want a conclusion of Paul's story since it doesn't truly end, even though it is kind of poetic how it ends there, read this, because you do kind of get a conclusion to it. And... Um, a lot of this book makes me think it's above the first um, novel. However, it's very weird. And there's a certain section of the book where it kind of just starts to drag a bit. And I, I know this is going to become a trend. But at some points it, it feels less of a story being told to me and more of Frank Herbert trying to shove his philosophy down my throat. And so in, in certain sections, like when Leto is in the desert early on, I found myself getting kind of bored of it. And maybe I'm just not the highest brow, intelligent man who should just understand all things high IQ. But for me, it kind of dragged a bit. Um, it picked up once Leto had his transformation, but that part was rather dull to me. But overall, I think this book is fantastic. I, I think it's still 
below Dune and Doom Aside. Doom Aside is my personal favorite, and then Dune, and then this book. But we'll see how I feel about God Emperor when we get there. But I'm going to talk about some spoilers. You don't want any if you've never read it. Then I, I think it's a book worth reading. And there are plenty of podcasts and, inter and reviews on here that go way more in depth if you want that. I'm going to talk about some things here, though. Um... We really deal with the whole abomination thing in this book, and it is a real tragedy what happens to Aliyah, Alia, however you want to say it. Because I really, I really, I really liked her character. And, um, you know, the thing that these pre-born kids are, have to deal with, you know, like Alia, Ganama, Leto, they all have to deal with not letting these other voices, these other past memories of past um, ancestors control the mind. And who makes a comeback in this book? I mean, it's not really him. It's more of his essence, his personality being imposed onto Alia. But it's the Baron Harkonnen. Uh, since she stabbed him in the first book, it seems to be that they have a bit more of a connection due to that. She took his life, so in death, his spirit tries to take over her. But it is a rather slow descent into despair, and it's a rather depressing aspect to this book. Because we could call her a villain, but ultimately nothing she does is her fault. And so, I do feel rather bad for her. We also get introduced to this preacher that wants to slander the name of Moed Deep and demystify the religion. We also learn that the preacher is indeed Paul Atreides. After the end of Dune Messiah, he went out into the desert, wanted to become a blind prophet. So that's what he did. And his sections are some of the best parts of this whole book. Here's some weirdness. Well, first off, these kids are like nine and talking like fluent adults. Sci-fi tigers go to attack the kids. They obviously fail, but they go to attack the kids. Sci-fi tigers. For some reason, sandworms doesn't make me bad an eye. Tigers. That gets me. Um, for a good portion of the book, Ali was trying to get... Uh, Ganama and Leto to take a bite of the spice and it's only when Leto starts to make his journey into the desert that he partakes of it. Which is interesting. We get this really powerful scene near the end where Duncan is talking to um, Alia and ultimately the Baron's taking her over. I mean, already she's starting to like little boys. And that's very much a barren thing. But she pushes him away. She tries to take him on a mission so that way one of her personal trusted bodyguards can stab him and kill him. And it's so sad for Duncan because he really truly loved Alia. And he has to deal with the fact that she's basically already gone. After, um, there comes a point where Leto allows these sand trouts to, like, those are like, you know the worm we saw in the movies, basically like a child? And then, you know, the big worms are the big worms, and then the sand trout are like the babies. And they start attaching to his skin, and Leto starts to become inhuman, and basically a superhuman. Um, and he finally meets his father, and those scenes were also just utterly fantastic. <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold. And then we have one of my favorite scenes in the whole book, which is the confrontation between Stilgar and Duncan. And that was uh, absolutely phenomenal. And I have nothing really to add, but it was a really, really good scene. But ultimately, Alia does get defeated. And Leto makes his plans. And we start seeing a little bit of that. He takes over the Bene Gesserit breeding program only to live for thousands and thousands of years for some goal that he has in mind. What do we have in store? We'll have to wait to see till we get to read um, God Emperor of Dune.
I know this wasn't as super in-depth. Uh, there's a lot to be talked about in this book, but these are just some highlights for me. Um, as I said, I've been a bit sick, so it's been a bit hard to concentrate. So there's probably a bunch of things I missed in the book. It's okay, because it just provides me a good excuse to probably sometime next year reread all, at least four of these books. I don't know if I want to go through all of it again, but at least Dune, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, and God Emperor. I definitely want to read it sometime next year. So, you know, hopefully if I'm 100% and I can, maybe I'll do a reread and I'll do a, a more in-depth, proper uh, perspective on the work. But uh, do I recommend it? Absolutely. It is another banger. It is a bit weird. These books, as you continue to read them, just get weirder and weirder. Like, sure, there's giant sandworms, but for some reason, Dune, the first book, feels the most grounded, if that makes sense. And it just goes off the rails from there. But if you can get past the weirdness, like possession of your ancestors or being able to turn to a literal superhuman godman, worm man, um, to, he literally like speed runs like the Flash. It's crazy, but uh, or or uh, sci-fi tigers. Like if you can get past all that, I think you're gonna find one of the most intellectually stimulating books um, you've ever read. Even though again, a lot of it feels it comes off rather pretentious because this is just some dude. It's not like he cured cancer or something, but he he really loves to shove his beliefs into these books or, or his philosophy and ideas, which is fine, and I enjoy reading it. And it's the same thing with, like, the Bioshock video games using Anne Rand's ideas to kind of tell a story. Um, but most of this book I, I really enjoyed, and it was such a blast. And there were a few parts that made me almost put it above Dune, but just due to the little bit of dragging in the middle, I had to drop it a bit. But I still think it's a phenomenal read, and it is so well, well worth your time. I hope the movie's got more people to start reading the books because they're so worth it. Anyway, that's all for now, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Remember, walk with rhythm. Till next book, where it will be a green paradise. Till then.